Hi guys, it's Tiny Tom Logan back with another video for you. And today we're going to be taking a look at the Intel i3 7350K because with KB Lake, uh, for the first time in a long time, we actually do have an overclockable i3. Now it's it's a CPU, so there's nothing really for me to kind of show off or anything. You understand, you know what it's like. Now with the uh, the fact it's a K series. You do need to make sure that if you want to overclock it, which would be the point of buying the board, that you are using a motherboard that supports overclocking. So that will be a Z170 because the older generation boards are supported uh, as long as you've got an updated BIOS. And the Z270. With the older Z170 boards, um, what you need to do is make sure you're on a relatively recent BIOS before these go in or before this one goes in just to make sure that you will get the compatibility and it will work. Otherwise, you then need to use a Skylake CPU. It gets complicated. Uh, but you can use BIOS flashback if you've got one of those new boards. Now, we use the Z270A. Now, we use this because it was the same board that we used to test the uh, 7700K and the 7600K, so it does make things fair. The only thing that we did change on it is we were on a slightly newer BIOS being the 0701 BIOS, which is available on the ASUS website, it's a public BIOS. So it does mean that uh, the results that we've got, we've got getting, you'll be able to directly compare with. Uh, with all of the brands at this present moment in time, I would keep an eye on your BIOS revisions because it is bringing about changes with uh, better memory compatibility, better memory speeds is something that I'm seeing happen across the board with all brands as well. Um, and uh, some of them are starting to get, amazingly, the CPU temperatures are starting to come down a little bit as well. So, i3, what's it like? Well, 180 pounds is a big price. 17999 at overclockers for an i3. Um, it's got no turbo, but it does sit natively at 4.2 gigahertz. Straight out of the box, click box, you know, bish, bosh, bash, run, lovely jubbly. Uh, we tested it with the same CPU cooler that we tested the other boards, uh, the other CPUs with as well, which is um, H110i GT. Now we use a big cooler because then when we overclock it, we've got overheads. It's a test system. We don't build a rig for each review, uh, despite what come, some people may think. Um, so with the i3, uh, it was just above 50 degrees at stock. Um, so when you kind of keep that in mind, and that was with... Uh, auto volts as well. Now, auto volts with one of these is gonna be somewhere between 1.15 and 1.2, depending on the motherboard, because the motherboard decides what it puts through it. Some motherboards may even put 1.25 in. For 4.2 gigahertz, you could, if you wanted to, uh, and you weren't necessarily interested in overclocking, but again, you're gonna confuse the point of having this in the first place, um, you could drop the volts down. We got it down to uh, 1.05 volts. And then at full load, obviously we had a big cooler, but at full load, it wasn't even breaking 50 degrees. It was high 40s. So there are options for you there. Overclocking wise, obviously it's KB Lake. People are gonna wanna know, does it do five gigahertz? Yes, it does do five gigahertz quite comfortably to be fair. We were um, actually able to boot into the system at both 5.1 and 5.2 gigahertz, but stability just wasn't there no matter what volts you put through it. It was kind of strange that it was still going into the OS at 5.2, if I'm honest. Um, and it was literally as soon as I opened CPU Z so I could get a screenshot or I was saving the screenshot, it was just cutting out. But it did the same thing with 5.1 too. So it was... I don't know, maybe it was something to do with the BIOS and the setup, I haven't got a clue, but five point, sorry, five gigahertz was stable at a, a manual voltage setting of 1.35 volts. And obviously I always push people to look and set their volts manually because the board can uh, change them for you. And the, the auto stuff is just, if you're overclocking and you can, you're making setting changes in the BIOS or in uh, the software, if you're doing it that way, then it's always best to manually set. So five gigahertz, lovely. Uh, the, with KB Lake, the um, IMC, the internal memory controller has been uh, quite strong as well. With this, we comfortably got 3,866 megahertz. Uh, we couldn't quite get four, but we do have a feeling this is something board related uh, because it was exactly the same that we got um, with the original tests. 
with some of the um, slightly higher ROG boards and stuff, we were comfortably getting four gigahertz on the memory. But again, I don't personally think that if you've bought an i3, you're likely to be spending the sort of money that you would need to to get 3,800 or 4,000 megahertz memory. If you were to ask me about memory, what should I buy? I'm saying with KB Lake, just because of how comfortable they are with high memory speeds, that 2800 would be a baseline advisory from me. It'd also be what I would do as well. I don't see the point in running 2133 or 2400 megahertz memory when that's the type sort of stuff that we were running on DDR3. Uh, memory prices um, have come down a little bit, something to keep in mind as well. 16 gigabyte of 2800 megahertz memory and it would be absolutely lovely. You'd only really wanna start pushing the boundaries more if your budget allowed it. Don't necessarily need to, but 3200 at the moment is a really nice kind of uh, even ground between performance and um, uh, price, but also kind of balances out that, you know, when you start pushing beyond 3200, as you push beyond 3200, the price pushes on quite a bit as well. So we've got those kind of things for you to keep in mind. Uh, with the overclocking, like I said, um, we got five gigahertz. It does get warm with five gigahertz though. We were seeing uh, upwards of 70 degrees, even with our big cooler. So um, I know people are gonna be saying about air cooling, why don't you test this, why don't you do that? Um, with the five gigahertz, I will say, if you're gonna, if you wanted air, you would need a big cooler or to have um, quite a tolerance for noise with a smaller cooler because it will crack on if you start running benchmarks. Games so much, won't necessarily, because it, the games don't necessarily put a massive strain on the CPU, but obviously when we're running OCCT with AVX and Prime 95, they really do kick butt when it comes to temperatures. And that was when we were getting to that 70 degrees mark. So um, uh, if you were to go down the air route and you were looking to play, you need to remember by pushing those volts up and putting the, pushing the megahertz up, so with the uh, upping the multiplier, you will get your temperatures will rocket quickly. So you need to kind of keep that in mind. If you want to overclock, you need to sort the cooling straight away. So uh, if you've got a, a basic kind of 30 or a 40 pound cooler, you're probably not going to be able to cut the mustard with a five gigahertz livable overclock. And it, it might even push on that little bit too much anyway. By buying a bigger cooler, what that does mean is, A, yes, it can cope with the temps and keep the temperatures down, but it also means it's got that distinct possibility it's gonna run a bit quieter. So there's all kinds of things to uh, keep in mind there, but obviously we wanna know about scores. How does it perform? So if we bring up the IDA 64 benchmark, what we can see here is uh, the i3 is kind of midships. Amazingly with this, this is the uh, IDA memory benchmark. Uh, so you can see it running at our stock, which was 3200 megahertz, because that's the memory we're using across the board for KB Lake this time around. And then the overclock is it running at 3866. So because it's running 3200 megahertz, it does put it um, uh, above you know, other things, but you can see the 6700K uh, running at 3200 megahertz, it's, it is consistently above that. So the IMC on these are very good, they're strong, um, but it doesn't necessarily make up for the sheer grunt that you can get with some of the multi-cored, multi-threaded um, uh, CPUs. When we move on to Cinebench, however, now you need to remember with Cinebench, this is a uh, 3D rendering uh, benchmark. Um, uh, so this is a very strenuous, it's a, it does really separate and it's all about CPU grunt. The cores um, are most important with this. It does like a bit of megahertz. You can kind of tune out <clears throat> some of the different differences with some clock speed, but you know, ideally with this, it's all about cores and that's why really the i3s are all at the bottom. You can see anything else above has got more cores and obviously you can see at the top, you've got a 6950X, which is obviously it's got 10 cores. So it kind of is self-explanatory with that one. X265, this is a new benchmark for us because uh, we've we're still having troubles getting the X264 benchmark running on 
the uh, the Windows 10 platform. There is a guide for it, but we've tried it at multiple rigs and it, we just can't seem to get it running. Anyway, so with this, you can see this has just got KB Lake in because it's only the it's the only um, CPUs that we've tested on X265, and you know it's kind of self-explanatory that you've got the um, dual core at the bottom, dual core with an overclock, and then you've got the i5, which is a quad core, and then above that you've got the quad core with hyper threading. Um, so it's kind of self-explanatory, it does make sense. But then when we get on to gaming, it's a bit of a different story because it does do quite well. The only one it really falls down on is the Gears of War CPU render, but that is CPU orientated. So that is a really good test because it obviously does pick out the difference between the, 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 the actual bits of silicon itself. But when you consider that Warhammer, Tomb Raider and the Gears of War GPU they're all fa fairly level pegging. Now, we do do other benchmarks. You can go and have a look on the OC3D website. There's a lot more information there. Um, we do many, many tests and different resolutions and all kinds of stuff. So you can go and have a look there. If this is something you are really you know, considering as a purchase and you want to spend extra time doing a little bit more research. So there is more information there. You can go and have a look. We just kind of skim across the top with the videos. So, if we were to go into a conclusion, my thoughts on the i3 would be it is quite expensive. £180 is a lot of money for a dual core CPU with hyper threading. I forgot I hadn't mentioned it. it's got hyper threading. It's not just two cores, it's two cores with hyper threading. So, basically, your system sees it almost like a quad core. Um, so, it can do two instructions per um, uh, core, basically. So, so, it's a lot of money, it's 180 quid. Um, if you uh, have a look at the results that we've presented you here, or you go and have a look on the OC3D website, you can see that when it comes to grunt, so like video editing, uh, rendering, um, it, you know, anything that's CPU intensive, it does fall down a little bit. But we would expect it to fall down a little bit because it's not four cores, it's not, you know, four cores with hyper threading. So anything like that, you're going to take a bit of a hit, but you kind of, you have to kind of get used to that fact. Overclocking it, it does mean it can claw a little bit back, um, uh, and it does make a difference with some of the tests. That's you know, you know, there's a healthy bit there, but it still never quite catches up with a native extra quad, you know, two cores that a quad core would bring to the table. So, what do I see with this? I see this. It, it's it's a very good gaming processor really and if you're looking to build yourself a gaming rig and have some fun with overclocking find out um, you know what it's all about willing to get into the bios and have a bit of a play and a tweak and you know you're not going to be afraid of changing bio uh, changing bioses and changing settings and oh my god it's blue screen in and you know you're gonna have to clear the bios and start again so if you're looking to start your overclocking journey and maybe take the next step into getting your pc master race degree then it's a very good place to go but if you're that person that moves on from gaming and it's quite often i don't know um uh transcoding videos, maybe you know, you, you're taking them from your DVDs because obviously everyone buys DVDs and or Blu-rays and then converts them to digital. Um, or you do a lot of video editing and, and you need that extra grunt, then it may be better for you guys to think about getting one of the i5s that might be 20 or 30 pounds more, but it will give you those native cores. With those processors though, you do need to keep in mind that you won't have any overclocking available to you, no matter what boards you use them on. But if you were to spend, for argument's sake, if you're not gonna be overclocking at all, with the i5s, if you were to buy one of them, um, you could maybe make the money up by buying one of the cheaper boards because you don't have to buy the Z270 boards. Um, uh, you could get one of the ones with, that don't have overclocking available, like the B150, for example. So you could save yourself some money in that respect and end up with something that, when it does come down to the programs that you're going to be using, it may be more beneficial to you. So it does get to the point where it's kind of on the teeter top, teeter topper, or however you, you know, seesaw, let's call it that where it really depends which way you want to go and what you need depends on which way you want to swing with it. Obviously the overclocking's nice, that's cool, but obviously if you do overclock, you're gonna to need to make sure that you, um, you, that you manually set those volts and you get decent cooling 
as well. Decent cooling is going to be critical. And if you do, for argument's sake, you decide that this one's not for you and you get the i5 above it that's not got overclocking, do the uh, manual volts on that as well because you'll be able to bring your temperatures down. I know I need to make a, a guide on that, but I've got some other um, boards that I need to get reviewed uh, from all of the brands actually before I move on to my guide segment. But I have got some plans to be able to help you guys through all that. So the i3, it's a mixed bag. It's pretty good for gaming. It keeps up with most things, um, even with the 7600K and the 7700K. But because it's obviously got two cores less and the hyper-threading doesn't necessarily keep it up with the fully-fledged quad-core, with the heavy CPU processing task, it can fall down a little bit in the charts. So it depends what you're going to go for. If it was uh, we were thinking about an award, we'd say gamer's choice because you can obviously save yourself a few quid. You can have some fun with it as well, and it's not going to make a massive difference to the bulk of games. There are some games out there that will kind of um, take a little bit of a performance hit because of the uh, lack of core speed and the lack of cores, um, or rather the lack of cores more than the core speed because you can obviously get it to five. But you know, with the bulk of the games that are out there, the ones that we've showed you as a highlight are gonna kind of replicate those kind of differences. So please let me know what you think. It's obviously a brave choice for Intel to bring a, uh, an overclocked i3 to the market. I think they kind of shot themselves in the foot not doing these in the past, to be fair. Um, and what do you think about the relatively high price of the fact that this one is a K-series overclock? I mean, uh, £180, I, I, even I think it, was, it should have been around the 150 mark because you can pick up, like the previous generation i3s were around the kind of 110 to 130 mark. So, but obviously we do get 4.2 gigahertz on this. The ones previous, I think it was the 6320 was, um, I think that was around 130, 135, and that was 3.9 gigahertz. So there's, there's lots of kind of ways around it, but if you were looking for something that you could have a bit of a play with, it's definitely got its place, but because of the price, it does get to kind of a bit of a blurry, do you go with the i5, even though you've, you're losing the overclocking. So that's just gonna be something that you guys are gonna have to decide. But if you do make a decision or you have got some opinions, I would love to hear your thoughts below in the comments. Also, you can go to the Overclock 3D Forum thread where we will be discussing all of this stuff with the other forum members. So if you're a chatty guy and you want someone to come and have a bit of chat with like-minded people, come in, join us and discuss with us. We're not scary. Well, most of them aren't scary. Anyway. This has been Tiny Tom Logan with his i3-7350K review. Uh, yeah, out. Ding!